To the left hand side for Vieira, he'll play through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Vela and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal Podcast, part of the 90 Min Football family. Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Arsenal are through to the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League for the first time in 14 years. It was stressful. It was difficult to watch at times. My blood pressure was all over the place, but we got there in the end. We got over the line and we're now in the hat. It's not really a hat, is it? But we're in the draw for the round uh, of eight, which I'm really, really excited about. Really, really buzzing about. Um, And we're going to break it all down right here on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. Now, I am recording this before the sun's even come up. Uh, So you'll have to bear with me if I've got bags under my eyes, if I'm yawning and all of that stuff. Um, I've got a really, really busy day today. Unfortunately, um, I've got another funeral to attend today. So um, I didn't want to leave this episode until this evening. So I figured it would be best to get up bright and early and record it before the sun comes up and release it to you guys uh, so that you can take it all in. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. I'm not used to doing pre-recorded podcasts. I'm just not. It feels so weird. It feels so strange without having the chat to bounce off. And I'm sure, um, you know, we're probably not going to go for the full hour because how long can one man talk for if he doesn't have any interaction with which to engage? But hey, um, thank you for bearing with me. on the pre-recorded stuff. I really, really do uh, appreciate it because I know that you guys will be used to uh, those live streams and this is quite different, isn't it? But any thoughts, any comments, um, anything you want to say, get it in uh, the the comments section and we'll, of course, pick those up on the next episode. What a night in the end. It's important to stress that part in the end because it was really, really stressful at certain points. Um, I genuinely felt physically sick at one stage and I had to go in at half time um, and uh, and get myself a seven up because I always find like seven up makes me feel better when I feel sick. And um, the first half, you know, we got the goal right at the end of it, but it just, it didn't feel like Arsenal had clicked. It felt like what we saw in the first leg in terms of Porto being really solid, nullifying a lot of what we do well. Um, stop and start in terms of the way that they wanted the game to go or or, or not flow, if you like. All of that was evident from the very beginning again. And it was, as I say, it was like what we saw in the first leg kind of carried over. Arsenal didn't create anywhere near as many chances as I'd have liked on the night. Um, Credit to Porto. We'll talk about Porto's tactics in in a bit. Um, But yeah, then we get the goal just before halftime. That kind of settles the nerves a little bit. And you think, okay, you know, it's a straight shootout now. But in the second half, I thought we started quite poorly, to be honest with you. I thought we lacked intensity. We lacked energy. Um, We were a bit sloppy. And Porto started to grow into the game at that point. And I just kept having flashbacks of what we saw unfold against Sporting last season in the Europa League. And when, when you think about it, right, last season, we went out of Europe at the hands to of Portuguese opposition at the Emirates Stadium on a penalty shootout. So you can guess what I thought was coming um, when extra time um, was over. Yeah, um, ever the optimist me. But look, we've got so, so much to get into. Let's start off um, by talking about the Emirates atmosphere, which really, really was electric. Mikel Arteta had been speaking in the build-up to this game about the need for the fans to bring the noise and bring the passion and make sure that they were right behind the team. And you know what they were. I can't ever remember a better atmosphere at Emirates Stadium pre-kickoff than that one. 
Now, that probably sounds mad, right? Because we've played North London derbies, we've played Manchester United, we've played Liverpool, we've played teams that we've had long-standing rivalries with. Um, but nothing, nothing I can think of or remember compares to that atmosphere at the beginning of the game. And I've said to you guys many, many times over the last year or so that Mikel Arteta, when he talks about the atmosphere, isn't doing it just to kind of, you know, fluff up the press conference. He isn't doing it because it's the thing that he thinks people want to hear. He does it for a very deliberate reason. And, and that is because you keep planting that seed. You keep talking about the need to bring the noise. You keep praising the atmosphere and highlighting the role that the supporters have to play. Even subconsciously, they'll go into a stadium and give it more because you've been talking about it. For years and years and years, you know, Emirates was dubbed a library. It was it was dead. You know, I used to go there. I, I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it and pretend it was anything special. Yeah, on the big games, it was all right. You know, when you played Spurs or United or whatever. But generally speaking, the atmosphere was as flat as a pancake. And especially on some of those European nights against the lesser fancied opposition. And Porto fall into that category, right? We were all pleased when we got Porto in the draw. Nobody looked at that and thought, oh, massive glamour tie. I'm right up for this. People looked at it and went, well, all the pressure's on us now. We need to get through this tie. And to be fair to FC Porto, I'm going to be critical of them as well, because I think there are things that deserve criticism. I think some of um, Sergio Conce Sal's behaviour, for example, um, needs discussing. But they did a really, really good job. And although the atmosphere was great at the beginning of the game, their performance, their approach, it did take the sting out of it for periods of time. And what I was really, really chuffed with and pleased by it was the fact that even after that, even when it would have been easy to kind of let the nerves take over, and I know that I was feeling it, because ultimately we were the favourites. We were the ones that everybody expected to go through. We're sitting top of the Premier League as we record this. FC Porto, I think, a third in the Portuguese top flight. And given that, plus the general Premier League snobbery that we 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 come across all the time, everybody thought, well, Arsenal should be absolutely wiping the floor with this side. And it wasn't the case. And as the game went on and we got into extra time and extra time didn't go the way that we wanted it to go and... You get to the penalty shootout. You could have been forgiven as an Arsenal fan for kind of shrinking and going into your shell a little bit. But no, not nowadays. That doesn't happen at the Emirates anymore. Because as I say, Mikel Arteta's very clever management and clever messaging has planted that seed in everybody's mind that, you know what, guys, you can make the difference. You can give the team that extra few percent that's required to get them over the line in the most difficult of moments. And the hostility towards the Porto players as they went up to take penalties was just incredible. It was the kind of thing that I expect to, to come across at, uh, away at Galatasaray, not at the Emirates Stadium, not where the Prawn Sandwich Brigade sit in North London. Like, it, it was just incredible. It really, really was. The atmosphere was super, super special, um, I thought. And I loved every single minute of it. In terms of the team that Mikel Arteta went with, I went quite big in the lead up to this game on the idea of Leandro Trossard being left out of the starting eleven and Gabriel Jesus coming in. I put it on TikTok, a clip from, from this very show or the show that we did the other day. It got lots and lots of views. I now expect to log into TikTok this morning and see lots and lots of abuse. Look, hands up. I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, I think that in terms of general play, Jesus probably would have done more and probably would have been a more constant threat to FC Porto just because the way he dribbles and the way he's sort of able to operate in really, really tight spaces, I think would have been well suited to this game. But Leandro Trossard scored the goal that levelled the tie, scored the goal that cancelled out Porto's advantage, the inv the advantage that they built through Galeno um, with his goal at the end of the first leg. It's it's difficult, though, to, to sit here and, and try and justify that call when Trossard did what he did in terms of that one major contribution. And it's not like I can sit here and say, well, you know, if he played Jesus, we would have won the game more comfortably because I think they limited Saka. I think at times they limited Odegaard. I think Declan Rice 
was limited. I think Kai Havertz was limited. I think Porto just done a really bloody good job um, of, of nullifying the threat and the impact of those players. And um, and yeah, you know, in the end, Arteta knew best. Odegaard obviously involved uh, in that goal as well and, and, and showing his brilliance. David Raya came back into the side, which was what we all wanted to see, I think, after the weekend. And we'll come on to talk about Raya in a little bit. But I think this has been a massive, massive week for David Raya and his Arsenal career, even though he's only played once. And I'll explain why a little bit later on. But team selection, um, you know, I wondered if Jesus was going to come back in the side. It's clear that uh, Partey is, is still not ready to play a major part um, as of yet. We're still building his fitness back up. But the really encouraging thing, looking at the bench, was obviously that Takahiro Tomiyasu was back in the picture. Um, you know, he's been he's been missed. He's been uh, somebody that has been incredibly versatile and effective for Arsenal since he arrived at the club. And so to have him back in the makeup of the squad is really, really important. And you just look at that Arsenal subs bench yesterday, and I'm just going to bring it up on my screen in front of me so I make sure that I don't miss anybody out. And all of a sudden, it looks a lot stronger, doesn't it? You know, Ramsdale in goal, Partey, Jesus, Smith-Rowe, Enketia, Fabio Vieira, Nelson, Zinchenko, Tommy Asu, as I mentioned, just a few of the names that are now starting to kind of reappear on the bench and adding that layer of depth that maybe we've been missing in recent months. Um, and that gives Mikel Arteta the opportunity to shake things up, change things up. Incidentally, we don't have a game now for about 19 days, something like that, which makes it... Um, you know, less of an issue that players had to play extra time and penalties last night in terms of the toll that that will take. Um, but yeah, I just thought looking at the squad, looking at the bench pre-game, I felt greater confidence because I looked at it and I went, yeah, you know what? We can change things if they're not going our way. So uh, yeah, positive signs there. Let's talk about that goal. Let's talk about that goal from uh, Leandro Trossard. Not only was it a great time to get the goal on the stroke of half time, where not I wouldn't say like I was like shitting it at that point. I wouldn't say that I was bricking it. I wouldn't say that I was really fearful for our Champions League hopes or our hopes of progressing. But I was starting to get to that point where I thought this is the first leg all over again. You know, the number of chances we've created has been very, very limited. The spaces are just not there. We're almost trying to lure this Porto side out but they don't seem that interested in overcommitting bodies forward and, you know, trying to, to find a second goal. And why would they? You know, they had the lead. It was on us to go out there and force the issue and try and make something happen. There was one particular pattern of play that I saw from Porto that just frustrated the life out of me, man. Um, and listen, it was effective on their part, but it, it was always... You know, we're in any danger. We're being pressed. We're being closed down at any point in the midfield. What do we do? We roll it back to Otavio at left centre-back. He'll take a touch and then he'll roll it back to Diogo Costa, who's very, very competent with the ball um, at his feet. And Porto would look to build from that again. And then it puts you in a position of, well, do we commit to a more aggressive press? And if you do that and you press higher up the pitch, then you potentially leave spaces in behind. And, you know, they had Galeno on the left, they had uh, Conseil Sal on the right, and they had, of course, Evan Nielsen leading the line, who I thought was incredibly physical, by the way. Really, really hard work in centre forward. Um, and you worried about the threat that they posed on the counter-attack. So Arsenal were right, in my opinion, to, um, to kind of be patient and rely on the fact that at some point their quality would come through. And that's exactly what happened because when Odegaard picked up the ball, um, brilliant little quick change of direction, brilliant bit of skill to kind of shake off the attentions of a defender. And then, you know, we always talk about that pass that Mikel Arteta coaches um, where it's almost like you're not playing it wide to the winger. You're playing it into a, an inside channel for the winger who is playing on his wrong side, whether that be Saka on the right or Trossard on the left you play it into their pass so that they can run onto the ball and, and do something right away and be effective from that position. And Leandro Trossard takes a really, really nice first touch to kind of set himself up. And he just passes it into the bottom corner. The finish is exquisite, but the pass, the bit of skill to create the room for the pass, 
Um, the fact that he sees it as early as he does is just superb from Martin Odegaard. And again, although up until that point, I looked at Trossard and, and Odegaard as two of the players that Porto had done a really good job of limiting. It just goes to show that at this level, when you're playing against the very best teams, you only need to switch off for a moment and the quality is there. They will punish you. And that's exactly what happened um, to FC Porto on the night. Brilliant goal. Really important goal, obviously, because it levelled the tie. But I think the timing of it um, was important in terms of not, you know, shaking up Porto because I actually thought they came out and started the second half quite well. But what it did was settle our nerves going into the break. The last thing you needed was, you know, for the players to be going in at half time and sitting around for 15 minutes thinking about the fact that they haven't found that equalising goal, that leveller in the tie yet. And the last thing I think we needed as supporters was a 15 minute period where we were kind of sitting there pondering how we go about this. So I think the timing, although it didn't really rattle Porto too much and change their performance, I think what it did do was the world of good for us from the Arsenal side of things. I've got to talk about Porto's style, Porto's tactics. They'll get a lot of stick today. Um, from Arsenal fans for the fact that they, as we've mentioned already, made the game very stop-start, that there was a lot of gamesmanship, every bit of contact, they were down on the ground, they were making the most of every coming together, every collision, taking their time, doing their absolute best to impact our, our rhythm and disrupt our flow, if you like. But I kind of rate it. And I think this is the type of thing that you're going to face on the continent. Like you can talk about, you know, I don't know, Brentford doing it. You can talk about, you know, some of the other Premier League clubs doing it. It's not to pick on Brentford. There are plenty that turn up to the Emirates and do exactly the same thing. But there's something about sides that have been competing in Europe's Premier competition year after year after year. They're almost more streetwise. And I think given that the threshold of what referees accept and don't accept in Europe um, is very different to what we see in the Premier League, it's a bit of a culture shock for us. Some of the duels that you would see uh, allowed to pass in the Premier League are not allowed to pass in European competition. Clement Turpan, a.k.a. Clement Trossard, looks exactly like Leandro Trossard, doesn't he? Um, he just didn't have control of the situation from the very beginning. And I'd spoken to some some people in the, the media room before the game who, who generally cover football for French TV. And they told me, oh, God, Clement Turpin's the referee. He loves to make it all about himself. Now, I'm not going to go as far as saying that's what he did last night. But he certainly had the opportunity, in my opinion, to nip certain things in the bud early on. And he didn't do it. And he allowed it to fester and he allowed it to continue. In my opinion, and we talk a lot about, you know, referees sometimes showing cards too early and then setting a precedent and setting a tone, which means it's inevitable that somebody's going to get sent off. I actually think that's exactly what Clement Turpin needed to do yesterday because some of the challenges, some of the fouls were just, you know, ridiculous in terms of the frequencies. I'm not saying that we came across like horrible leg breaking challenge after horrible leg breaking challenge. That's not my point at all here. Persistent fouling, though, was right at the top of Porto's agenda and it needed to be dealt with way earlier than it was. We've been talking a lot over the last few weeks about the number of minutes for which the ball has been in play. Here's a stat for you. The ball was in play for 66 of the 132 minutes of football played last night. 66. Mental, isn't it? You factor in, you know, the amount of added time. I don't think there was enough. I mean, the end of the first half really got under my skin, right? I think he added three minutes at the end of the second half, which again was way below what he, what he should have. But then you go back to that first half and you think about it, right? I, I reckon, and I, I don't think I'm exaggerating here at all. I reckon that Porto spent 10 to 12 minutes taking throw-ins alone. I mean that. And when you put that into kind of context and think about that and think about 
how much time they're taking on something as trivial as a throw in, you know, where on earth or how on earth can you justify only showing one minute of stoppage time? I remember walking in into the press room from my seat at half time, absolutely fuming. And I shouldn't have been fuming because we just got the goal four or five minutes before the break, the goal that leveled the tie that I was just talking about, relaxed everybody, relaxed everybody's nerves. Instead, I'm going in and I'm livid because I cannot, for the life of me, understand how he has justified adding just the one minute on. It was wild. It really, really was. Um, but tactically, again, and, and I will give them their props and their flowers, they were very, very good. Not only did they, as I keep saying, disrupt the rhythm and the flow of the game, they did a really, really good job, I think, of setting up in their way with two defensive midfield players, um, Varela and Nico Gonzalez, very, very good defensive midfield players, very, very streetwise defensive midfield players, players that are at a really good physical level, especially Varela. Like Nico um, Gonzalez is bigger, but Varela, I think, is someone that probably won't be at Porto for that much longer. We talk about them as being a club that normally sort of, you know, track down assets from South America, bring them over to Europe, nurture them, develop them out a little bit further, get them accustomed and used to the European game before selling them on for huge profit. Varela is probably somebody that falls into uh, that category in the sense of, I just don't see him being at FC Porto for that much longer because he's that good. And I just want to bring up actually um, his, uh, his history. He's just 22 years old. Um, he's a player I'd, I'd look at, honestly. And I remember saying the same thing about Manuel Ugarte of Sporting, who I think went on to join PSG. Um, but yeah, Varela come through the academy at Boca Juniors, joined at FC Porto for 8 million euros back in August last summer. They'll probably get 40, 50 million euros for him this summer if they wanted to sell him, if they were open um, to that. And it's, a you know, another feather in their cap in terms of being able to identify these players, uh, bringing them over and selling them on then for huge, huge profits. But for all the, the stick I'm giving them because of their approach, which isn't ideal, it's not what I want to pay uh, a ticket to watch. Ultimately, it was effective and that you cannot deny. On to the penalty issue out. Um, because there wasn't that much football to discuss, really, was there? There wasn't a, a host of chances. It wasn't like um, the game was enthralling or particularly captivating in terms of what we saw across the first 120 minutes. But, yeah, I mean, the penalty shootout, you're always nervous going into a penalty shootout. I think that just happens. I, I think that's just par for the cause. I think, as a fan, it, it feels horrible. Arsenal according to Mikel Arteta, had done a lot of preparation for a penalty shootout. Um, a lot of different players have taken penalty kicks for the team this season. And maybe, uh, it was a great point raised by James Benj, I think it was in the press conference, maybe that served well in the end because a lot of these players were in the habit of taking penalties. Sometimes Saka takes them, sometimes Odegaard takes them. Um, you know, Declan Rice was incredibly confident. Kai Havertz, has scored 21 out of 21 penalties in his career to date. So those guys all step up and they do brilliantly. All of the finishes, really assured, really, really confident. And I remember saying to, to my colleague, Xavi, um, before the shootout happened, this is either going to go one of two ways, right? So you're either going to get the, the situation where David Raya, who's been much maligned, much criticised by some Arsenal fans. A lot of Arsenal fans just weren't having him because of the Aaron Ramsdale thing, because of how much affection they felt for Aaron Ramsdale. Not because there's a particular dislike to David Raya. I have to make that clear. It's more because of the fact that, you know, Ramsdale was such a fan favourite and he's been moved out of the team, replaced by this guy that I don't think was totally convincing at the start of his Arsenal career. So I said to my colleague, Xavi, either David Raya becomes the hero here and has his moment where that connection, that bond with the fans that's maybe been lacking because of people's affections for Aaron Ramsdale and the fact that some feel he's been hard done by, or the narrative that you just don't want rears its ugly head. 
i.e. David Raya doesn't get near any penalty. Kai Havertz misses a penalty. Another player that people have taken time to warm to and been really, really critical of. You, you just felt like this was going to be massive in terms of a positive or really, really negative outside of even the, the kind of black and white of you're through or you're out. Do you know what I mean? Um, our penalties were Im Im immaculate. The atmosphere that we generated in the North Bank behind that goal to put people off um, as they stepped up to take a penalty, I thought was flipping sensational. And as I mentioned earlier on, it was something that you'd expect at Galatasaray rather than at Arsenal. So that's a that's a good thing in terms of, you know, being impactful on the outcome. You'll never know how much of an impact that had on the Porto takers, but just to kind of, um, you know, to to bring that into the equation is something extra and, and is making the home advantage pay. Essentially, all of our four penalties were brilliantly scored. It was Odegaard, it was Havertz, it was Saka. And then the fourth one was Declan Rice. We didn't even need to take the fifth because of the way the shootout went. David Raya, though, he'd obviously done his homework. And we saw pictures inside the stadium of him sitting with one of Mikel Arteta's coaching staff and going through some preparation on paper that they'd obviously done with regard to where some of the Porto players were going to put the ball. Not only does he have the education then to go into that shootout in a really, really good position, not only does he hold his nerve in terms of, you know, sort of waiting. And 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 if you watch it back, particularly with the match winning save, he doesn't actually go that early. Now, we always say that keepers can't afford to wait until the striker is right on top of the ball because they won't get there in time and that they almost have to guess. And I think 90% of the time, that's absolutely bang on. But David Raya, didn't do that for that last penalty. Watch it back again. He is on his way before the ball, uh, sorry, just after the ball's been struck. He is He's on his way at that point. The spring that he showed and the agility that he showed to get down and make that save was just incredible. And the first save that he makes as well, again, incredible agility, gets the slightest of touches, which tips it onto the post. But then it comes back off the post and kind of hits his sort of calf um, and goes wide. And that is the kind of luck that David Raya really, really needed because he's not had much in an Arsenal shirt. He's always felt like someone who, you know, just couldn't catch a break. And there it was. And, you know, obviously he makes the save by tipping it onto the post initially and he gets his reward in the end. But I just thought his heroics in, in the penalty shootout were, were just incredible. But I also will keep stressing and reiterating the point of that's the moment for him. That's when David Raya really became an Arsenal player. That's when the fans finally, in my opinion, put to rest the Aaron Ramsdale agenda and the calls for Aaron Ramsdale to return to the side and opened their arms and received David Raya as one of our own. That was the moment. And it's almost been the perfect week for David Raya in that um, Aaron Ramsdale played, of course, against Brentford. Mikel Arteta had no choice but to bring him in due to Raya still being on Brentford's books technically and that they're not being allowed. Ramsdale comes in, makes an absolute howler of a mistake. Arsenal still somehow find a way to win the game. And then Raya comes back in, in a knockout tie in the Champions League and proves to be the hero. It's almost as though if you wanted to script a week that would do exactly what I've mentioned for David Raya, earn him a place in the hearts of the Arsenal fans. This was it because nobody's going to be chatting about Ramsdale now. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I, I love Aaron Ramsdale as a player and as a person. I think he's incredible, but he's come in. He's made exactly the type of error that Mikel Arteta probably felt was coming and was worried about. Hence why he went out and got another goalkeeper. And then the one that he got in and the one that he backed and the one that people criticised him for backing proved the hero in a penalty shootout to put Arsenal in a position that they haven't been in for 14 years. It was just the perfect way for David Raya to, to build and found that connection, I think, with the Arsenal fans. So, yeah, really, really important. <laughs> 
keep mentioning that Arsenal are through to the last eight for the first time in 14 years. The significance of that is huge because this football club is way too big to A, not be in the Champions League and B, not be competitive in the Champions League. And if you go back to when we were last in it, we had a six, seven year stint where we just couldn't get past the last eight. And that damaged our stock as a European elite club, I think. People always used to look at us. And, you know, when we look back at it, there's context to that. A lot of the time we were drawn against incredible sides that we just weren't on the same level as. But people probably didn't look at it like that back then. And again, that kind of Premier League snobbery that I keep talking about comes into play where it's like, well, they're a Premier League side. They should absolutely be through to the last eight, last four of the Champions League, year after year after year. We know it doesn't work like that. And we also know that we came up against Barcelona with Messi and Bayern Munich in their pomp and all the rest of it. And, you know, we had a couple of opportunities. You know, the Porto one was really, uh, Porto, I beg your pardon, Monaco one was really, really disappointing. But, you know, we weren't able to get over the line. And we've done that now, which just shows another step in the evolution and in the progress and in the, the efforts to restore Arsenal as one of Europe's super clubs. We're there in terms of size. We're there in terms of fan base. We're there in terms of financial power, etc., etc. We know that. But in terms of our status in people's minds, being back in the quarterfinals of the Champions League is massive for that. And it's another thing that Mikel Arteta has managed to do that felt a million miles away when he took over. So lots of uh, props for that. And it is really, really significant, um, even if some people would will laugh at us or turn their noses up at that. I do uh, want to talk about the Porto boss, uh, Sergio Conceição. We're going to do that right after this. Sergio Conceição, I thought, tactically, did a cracking job on Arsenal over two legs. I think the housery was at 100%, and that a lot of that comes from him. Pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, he'd have played under Jose Mourinho at some point. And I'm sure he'd have picked up a lot from him in terms of the stop-start nature. You know, Portuguese football has this reputation of being like kind of really silky and, and really like pleasing on the eye. And it is a lot more, it is a lot more industrial at times, I would say, than Spanish football. And I, I don't think that always gets kind of noticed or highlighted. Um, but the thing that I want to bring up now is not um to do with his tactics, it's not to do with um sort of the way he approached the game. And again, look, I don't have to like it, but I also, you know, don't have an issue. I, I can't really have an issue with it, right? Because I think if you're the weaker side, you're going to do what you can to try and level the playing field as best as you can. Fair enough. But Porto coach Sergio Conceição came into his press conference after the game and accused uh, Mikel Arteta of insulting his family and in particular somebody who's no longer with us. Now, Arsenal moved very, 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 very quickly to brief the media that this didn't happen, that this was not a thing, and, and they strongly denied claims that Mikel Arteta did what Sergio Conceição is accusing him of. And that got me thinking, right? Things are going to be said on the touchline in the heat at the moment. Exchanges are going to take place. I would never condone um, somebody having a go at somebody's family. And if you're going after someone or making a comment about someone that is no longer with us, whether you know that at the time or not, that is going to get under somebody like Sergio Conceição's skin or anybody for that matter on the receiving end of that type of comment. So I understand that. OK, first of all, I don't want to believe that Mikel Arteta would do that because I think listening to him talk, he's someone that, that values family. He's someone that, um, you know, is is respectful of family and, and understands its importance. I'm not saying that, you know, it's impossible for someone to say something that they shouldn't in the heat of a moment. We've all been there. We've all done it. But I just want to think, I just want to put this out there, okay? Because as I keep saying, I can't possibly know what Arteta said to Conceição it seemed like when the two were speaking after the game, Arteta genuinely didn't know what Conceição's issue was. And Conceição was explaining it. 
as I've already mentioned, Arsenal have denied that Arteta did what he's being accused of. So I'm not going to say too much on this subject, but I will say one thing. Is this the first time that Sergio Conceição has lost the match, spent the entire match behaving like a petulant child, and then at the first opportunity he gets, he's complained about somebody else's touchline behaviour? No, it's not. Ask Mikel Arteta, ask Pep Guardiola, ask Thomas Tuchel, and ask a Portuguese coach who Sergio Conceição referred to as a puppet. Like, uh, that's that's all I'm going to say on it. I can't know cer- for certain if he's lying. I can't know for sure what was said or wasn't said. But I can know, and I do know, that Sergio Conceição has a history of stoking the fire on the touchline, being a big part of the reason why things maybe boil over and then taking the moral high ground when he probably doesn't have a leg to stand on in that department. But hey, um, just wanted to bring that up. Couple of uh, bits and pieces, statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Before we um, we do our player ratings, I do want to do that. I'm looking forward to doing that actually. After that one, the last five teams um, to uh, to eliminate FC Porto from the Champions League in the knockout stages, all five of them got to the final. Inter last year, they were runners up in the competition in the end. Chelsea did it on their way to being crowned champions of Europe in 2021. Liverpool did it when they won the Champions League in the 18-19 season. They also done it in the 17-18 season when they finished runners-up. And if you go back to 16-17, when Juventus finished runners-up, they too eliminated Porto along the way. So maybe there's a good omen there. Arsenal secured 91.28 million euros in prize money by reaching the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League, a record result in the club's history. Uh, the starting fees were worth 15.64 million. UEFA coefficient um, stuff, 25 million. The market pool, 18.3 million. The group stages generated 12.13 million, four wins and a draw. Uh, their progress uh, in the last 16 um meant that they, or their participation, I beg your pardon, in the last 16 generated 9.6 million euros and their participation in the quarterfinals will generate 10.6 million euros. So 91 million euros. You know, when people talk about the, the financial significance of the Champions League, this highlights it. And when people talk about silverware, 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 it's only about silverware. And I always come back and say, look, guys, yes, silverware is what we want as fans. But if I were an owner of a football club, I'd rather a European run than winning the FA Cup or the Carabao Cup. The winners of the Carabao Cup this year didn't even get a million pounds in terms of prize money. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's about half a mil, the prize pot. The FA Cup is also a pretty insignificant prize pot when you compare it to the Champions League. So when Arsenal used to say, we need to stay in the top four, because that's the only way we're going to handle the stadium debt, et cetera, et cetera. This is why. Now, obviously, it's on a bigger scale now because as years go on, the TV revenues increase, et cetera, et cetera. But this just highlights and puts into context how much money you can generate from the Champions League. And when we're talking about profit and sustainability as often as we are, you can understand why this is very high up on people's agenda. So Arsenal secured £91.28 million in... Um, uh, million euros, I beg your pardon, in prize money by reaching the quarterfinals. And it could be more if they progress further. OK, one more short pause and then it is time for our player ratings. It's that time in the show where I share with you guys my player ratings and you all start typing furiously in the comments asking me why I've given so and so this and why I've given so and so that. That's why I love it. Um, let's start off with David Raya. I'm going to give David Raya a 10, man. Um, you know that I don't give out 10s very often, but for a goalkeeper to be the hero in the shootout and be the difference maker, it's as good as it gets for David Raya. And I keep talking about the significance of the moment and how that could be the kind of making 
of his relationship with the Arsenal fans. So I'm going to give David Raya a 10. Ben White, I'm going to give Ben White a seven and a half. I thought he defended really, really well against Galeno um, and also got forward often in terms of trying to help us break Porto down. Not quite as effective in those positions um, as he maybe was against Brentford, where he got a couple of assists, of course, but a solid display from him. Uh, William Saliba, I'm going to give him a seven. Um, I thought there were a couple of moments in the first half where Saliba just looked a little bit nervous. And I've seen that more this season from William Saliba. And it's understandable, right? The guy's still incredibly young, still developing, still learning. And I think last year he just played out of his skin. But I do feel like as great as he is, I'm not as assured with him as I was last season. And I thought in the first half, there were a couple of poor decisions. For example, Porto played this long ball forward at one stage in the first half. And it was high up in the air. And Saliba had like all the time in the world to kind of bring it down and build or, you know, watch it come down and then just maybe nod it back to David Raya, who was on his toes waiting to to maybe collect it. And instead, he kind of headed it back into like no man's land. And a couple of Porto players had kind of broken from midfield and managed to get on the ball. And it put us on the back foot. And that wasn't the only time that there was a foul that he gave away in the first half, right on the touchline that I didn't think he needed to make which saw him go into the book as well. So it's not a bad performance from William Saliba. A seven is a solid rating, but it wasn't his best um, for me. Gabriel, I'm going to give him an eight because I just think Gabriel has just been immense. And I think he's kind of taken over as the central defensive leader. He probably always was that really because he's older, he's more experienced, he's been at the club longer. I'm sure his English is better, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it was always like last season, it was like Saliba, 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 the Rolls Royce, William Saliba. And Gabriel kind of was palmed off as being like this kind of side bit for William Saliba. And actually, no, he's just as important, just as imperative um, to all the good things that Arsenal do. I'm going to give Jakob Kivior a seven and a half. I thought he defended really, really well at times. Probably was a little bit limited going forward, but we know that that's what Jakob Kivior is. That's why later on in the game, Alexander Zinchenko, who I'm not going to give a rating, by the way. I'm not going to go with the subs, but... I thought he had a stinker when he came on, gave the ball away really sloppily on a couple of occasions in Chenko. And you look at him and you go, that's the guy that you bring on to give you greater control and make sure that you're assured in possession. And we did it. And actually, I felt more nervous and less confident in our ability to keep the ball and essentially not do anything silly. But Kivior, seven and a half out of ten. Jorginho, I'm going to give Jorginho a six. Now, some people will say this is harsh. This is not me saying that I don't like Jorginho as a player anymore or that like overnight my mind and opinion on him has changed. What I am saying is, is that when I talked about in the lead up to this game, the risk of playing Jorginho three times in a week, and this wasn't a, a point that I thought of alone. I, ha I have to you know, give the credit where it's due. Um, one of our listeners whose name I can't remember, I apologize. Um, not that I don't remember listeners' names. I just don't remember which particular listener said this. But someone made the point of, is asking him to play like three games in the space of a week just like a little bit too much? Um, and, and he was bang on. You know, he was spot on because he is somebody who is, you know, in the, the latter stages of his career, shall we say. I'm not going to say he's ever relied on fitness or, or his engine or anything like that. But what he has done is he's come into a side and his role has changed because he's gone from being the guy that you bring on in certain game states that fills in every now and again to a regular starter in this side, partly probably because of what he unlocks in Declan Rice. But I just thought physically he struggled a little bit yesterday um, he was clever in the sense of he'd put his body in the right places at times to draw fouls and win free kicks when he felt and, and there was a bit of danger that he'd lose a particular duel in a dangerous part of the pitch. And he, so he used his experience to kind of navigate through it, but it was by no means Jorginho's best performance. I didn't think his passing was at the same level as it normally is. And again, you know, if you're physically not at it, then that can have an impact. Like I, I remember playing football and playing bad passes because I was knackered. So then you play lazy passes, um, you know, and you can be knackered, not just 
physically, but mentally, I think it was probably more a physical thing with Jorginho. But I was worried about him at points in that game. And I was actually thinking, do we bring Thomas Partey on? And then I kept thinking, well, how fit is Thomas Partey? And, you know, there was 15, 20 minutes to go of the 90. And I thought, if you bring him on now, he might be able to get through that 15, 20. But then if this goes to extra time, then you're asking a player who's had hardly any minutes of late to then play a longer period of time. And that could be a risk as well. So I think Arteta managed it in the best way that he could really, given the circumstances. But um, yeah, I wasn't massively impressed by Jorginho last night. So he gets a six for me. Martin Odegaard, I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him an, an eight and a half. Now I would have given him an eight, same as Gabriel, because I think work rate was there. Leading by example was there. Um, I do think Porto did a really good job of limiting him at times, but he he constantly kept trying to find solutions popping up in different places. The reason he gets an 8.5 rather than the 8 that I gave to Gabriel is the fact that when the penalties came along, Martin Odegaard didn't mess about. I'm the captain. I'm the guy that's going to lead this team. I've been leading the press all night. I've been leading this team in terms of the intensity, in terms of the effort levels. Um, I carry out Mikel Arteta's instructions. And not only do I do that, I make sure that everybody else around me does that too. I am his voice on the pitch. I'm the leader here. I'm going to step up and I'm going to take the first penalty. And when you step up and you dispatch a penalty as confidently as he did, it set the tone for the shootout. Um, and I think that's really, really important. So eight and a half. Declan Rice. I'm going to give Declan Rice a... I'm going to give him a seven. Again, you might think that that's a little bit harsh. And again, I think this was a lot to do with Porto doing a really, really good job on him and knowing what he's about, tracking his runs into the box, um, getting bodies around him when he picks the ball up and looks to go on those marauding Declan Rice runs that we've all become accustomed to. Just wasn't anywhere near as effective yesterday um, as he normally is. Not to say he was bad. That's why I'm not giving him anything below a seven, but it wasn't his best performance. Saka on the right-hand side. I'm going to give Saka a 6.5. Again, you know, part of that was down to the fact that Porto were hot on him and knew that he was one of our biggest threats and made special arrangements, in my opinion, to try and deal with his threat. But although he managed to wriggle free of his man a few times, it always felt like he never really got going because... A foul was just around the corner, which again is no fault of his own. But I just didn't think Bakayo Saka was massively effective last night. So six and a half. Trossard, I'm going to give him a seven because aside from the goal, I thought he was anonymous for large periods of that game. And although I've said earlier on in the pod that, you know, when I said that I wouldn't play him, you know, he's he's come up with a big contribution. Arteta was justified in that decision. I just, I, I don't think he offered that much else. I think that's why he came off when he did. Um, so seven for me. Kai Havertz, I'm going to give him a seven and a half. Um, didn't think he was as good in possession. Didn't think he was as effective up front as he has been in recent weeks. Again, you have to put that caveat in there of Porto doing a really, really good job. But what I liked about Havertz's performance yesterday was that, you know, we were talking about Porto being really streetwise and knowing when to commit a foul. I think Kai Havertz showed that yesterday as well, that, He'd battle and, and fight for things. And at times he's a little bit clumsy in the way that he goes into challenges. He leads with his arms and that, you know, upsets people, particularly on the continent. I think he showed his experience. We keep talking about how young he is, but how experienced he is relative to that Champions League winner, of course, won the Champions League in Porto's backyard. But I think what we saw from Havertz was that experience that we keep hearing about, you know, knowing when. He's messed up and knowing when he needs to take a foul, when he needs to make a foul, knowing when he needs to take a booking, knowing what type of foul to make in order to, you know, limit the referee's ability to punish you. There are certain fouls that you will get a yellow card for because they're really, really cynical. And there are certain fouls that just come across as being a little bit clumsy. And actually, you probably get away with two or three of those over the course of a game. So I think Havertz showed that. And also another stat um, that I read this morning uh, is that Kai Havertz won 10 of his 13 aerial duels against Porto. And that is the most by any Arsenal player in any competition since, wait for it, Skodran Mustafi 
versus Vittoria Gimaraes in the Europa League back in October 2019. Um, this is also the most aerial duels won by an Arsenal forward in a European game since Yaya Sonogo versus Bayern Munich in the Champions League back in February 2014. Remember him? Um, the point I'm making here is that he wasn't as effective as he can be or probably should be, but the the willingness to compete and battle and, and in an aerial sense, which is something that we probably lack in other parts of the team, using his body, using his frame. Things that I wouldn't have associated with Kai Havertz, by the way, before he came to the club. He's very effective at doing that. So that's where I'll give him his props. I gave him a seven and a half because I think he was a bit more effective than Rice, a bit more effective than Trossard, not as effective as Odegaard or Gabriel on the night and certainly not my man of the match who is David Raya because of the contribution that he made in the end. I'm going to leave it there. We're through. Enjoy it. Lap it up. We've got a nice long break now. I say nice long break. It's been an intense few days. And so I'm kind of looking forward to a little bit of a break. But I also know that two days into it, I'm going to be bored out of my head and desperate to find things to talk about and discuss with you guys. Um, we're going to keep the content flowing. I've got lots of ideas of things that we can do um, over the course of this period Arsenal now have off. Um, thank you for tuning in to the Chronicles of Aguna. As always, much love to every single one of you. Apologies again for the fact that this is a pre-recorded edition. I'd love, absolutely love to get your questions in the comment section below. And when we're back tomorrow with another episode, we'll pick out some of those and we'll work our way through them. Thank you um, very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Arsenal, for giving us something to be pleased about on this Wednesday morning. And I will see you all very, very soon with more. Until the next time, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.